Hello, people, and welcome, welcome, welcome back to our mini series. Is that what we're calling these mini series? To me, it's not a mini series. To me, it's a major series. Um, and the major thing that we're going to talk about tonight is mitochondria and cellular energy, chronic fatigue, damaged metabolisms, people that are tired, overweight. Kind of ties into thyroid. So I'm going to ask this quiz question, and let's see if anyone can type it in to the little box that you type things into. Let's see if anyone can get this right. You guys ready? Okay, get out a pen. This is like one of those game shows where whoever gets it right first gets a prize, except for we don't have a prize. So we're talking about mitochondria, but then I put in the notes, we're talking about thyroid. Hmm, how does that even really work, right? So... When I say insulin, you think blood sugar. When I say estrogen, you think female reproductive stuff. When I say thyroid hormone, what do we all immediately think? Like, what do we all learn in school? Um, what does thyroid do? And everyone pretty much says controls metabolic rate or controls basal metabolic rate, correct? Uh, so that's nice, but what does that mean? Like, how does that get carried out? How does that work? How do the thyroid hormones regulate metabolism? What's the mechanism? If insulin's, you know, mechanism of control is over blood sugar, what's, it's over, uh, wait a minute, you think about it, wait a minute, it's over metabolism. Well, what's regulating metabolism? What, what are the, what's the thyroid actually directing? What's the thyroid yelling at to do the right thing? It's your mitochondria, right? So a mitochondrial problem is kind of a thyroid problem. And a thyroid problem is a problem with directing your mitochondria. They're intimately linked. One is hormonal and then one is the actual little organelle that's doing the job. Okay, and so that's a kind of catch all thing, right? Then on top of all that, on top of all that, there's all this new research coming out, and I've been in the middle of this because um, my son is involved in actually some of the top researchers in the world that are doing this is what he's working on for his, um, uh, you know, what do you call it, academic degree. And there's actually people like my son who measure mitochondrial populations. They have really expensive cameras that wa wash you in St. Louis, and they let these 22-year-old kids operate this millions of dollars worth of equipment to take really high-speed photos of mitochondria and to see what makes there be more mitochondria and what makes there be less mitochondria, right? They're measuring the numbers of mitochondria that are present and how the populations or numbers of mitochondria change. This is a really hot topic in science right now for a whole variety of reasons, mostly to do with things like anti-aging and drug development and stuff like that. But for our purposes, what we're going to talk about today is the, there's a really big problem if mitochondria can't work, if they don't have the nutrients they need to make energy, because that's going to affect your brain, your cardiovascular system, it's going to affect your detoxification pathways, it's going to affect every cell in your body, right? But there's an even bigger problem on the horizon if you simply don't have enough mitochondria physically present, there's just not enough of them there. And believe it or not, people are taking pictures of these things and counting them, which is kind of cool. That's why I was just over the Christmas break was looking at my son's photos that his lab is doing. He's like, yeah, there's one there, dad. And there's one over there. And yeah, we're counting how many of them are here. Look, there's not too many over there. Right? And so what Dr. Richard Lord figured out, who's a researcher that I work with very closely right now, and who's a scientist that developed organic acids testing as we use it in, in the integrative medicine world, right? This is his whole project from 35, 40 years ago. What what Dr. Lord discovered, well, he didn't really discover, but he sort of tied together, was that all this latest research on mitochondrial populations has a direct ramification for what we're doing with um, with organic acids testing and amino acid testing with um, with integrative medicine or functional medicine, whatever you call our subject area, right? And so, if there's not enough mitochondria present, even with the proper thyroid medication dosage it's going to be very hard for that thyroid medication to have its full effect. And if there's not enough mitochondrial populations present, you're going to have problems not just with 
thyroid not regulating properly, right? But with brain function, cardiovascular function, muscle strength, energy, all the kinds of things that you associate. And you'll have accelerated aging. There's a whole host of problems. And um, this gets pretty interesting. So that's what we want to talk about. So let's see, what do my notes say here? Sorry, I was just rambling. Uh, chronic fedora, exam connection in thyroid and mitochondria, high and low markers we're going to talk about. Oxidative stress is the stuff that damages right, um, mitochondria, and then um, you can look a little bit at supplement programs. So here I am, I've been working really hard the last few years, I've worked for several years with Functional uh, Institute for Functional Medicine, helping lead their practice implementation program over the last few years. Uh, I worked with Mayo Clinic, I'm now working with Dr. Lord, practically full-time, and I still am in practice, believe it or not. We have Kalish Institute classes coming up at the end of January. We have my mentorship. That's the big year-long class. You get a thousand bucks off if you uh, use that uh, discount code. We're signing up people right now. It's a one-year program. You get to review labs with me live in class for a year. We have this massive curriculum that you can go through, pre-recorded lectures on this whole organized system that I use in my functional medicine practice. and um, we talk a lot about business stuff, mostly about clinical lab interpretation. You can do a Zoom tour with one of our salespeople if you're interested in the mentorship. And then on February 8th, we have this telehealth business essentials boot camp. It was our most popular boot camp last year. Eight week deep dive on you know practice management, more on the business side. Okay, so one is business, telehealth, business essentials boot camp and then the year-long mentorship is starting at the end of January okay so those are two things that are coming up you can go to the website get more information if you want all right so now let's talk about this kind of fascinating subject really all right uh, it's almost like hard to know where to start but why would you use organic acids testing in general I just test everybody so I'm a kind of outgrown this slide but if you're still thinking about like who should I test you can think complex patients so you can figure out what's going on simple patients because maybe you're even more frustrated you don't know what to give them right in some ways simple patients are harder than complex patients um, I use it in my practice as an annual general health check uh, for patients and um, you can do it for prenatal programs you can do it for patients that have just gotten through breast cancer treatment you want to help them recover for weight loss for fatigue depression anxiety and one of the sort of core portions of organic acid testing is looking at mitochondrial function. I can't imagine being in practice, you know, these days without, if, if I didn't have this particular test. I mean, it's sort of become the, the absolute essential component to so much of what I do. Um, really can't imagine that. So... You can also measure detox capacity, oxidative stress markers, and these things are all going to be directly related to what we're talking about today. Okay. So now there's um, just a, a broad subject that I want to cover because when we talk about amino acids, we, we tend to associate them with the uh, non-protein functions. Okay. So, and what we're talking about today is that there are many functions of amino acids. So one of the functions of amino acids are what they call non-protein functions. This means not making proteins. This means things like arginine that's important for getting rid of ammonia. Or let's see, tryptophan, maybe the most famous one, right? Tryptophan as a precursor to serotonin and melatonin. So, and that's all good and true. But what's even more important perhaps then the protein, then the non-protein functions of amino acids are the protein functions of amino acids, okay? And that's not talked about a lot. And so I just want to mention this because it's sort of glossed over in almost all the educational stuff that I ever see. And we want to kind of, I don't know, what's the term? Reclaim our ability to understand that, okay? So sorry, I just screwed up the screen there. Let me try this again. So um, why is this so important? Because it's a confusing subject area, and if you get it wrong, you're kind of missing out on one of the main points of why amino acids are so important, okay? And so I'm going to try to spread this throughout the theme today, but um, 
just think about though the ways that you can use amino acids number one is in these non-protein functions very specific functions like tryptophan for serotonin but if the person is low in tryptophan if the person is low in tryptophan that is going to interfere with their ability to make proteins in the body which proteins all proteins except for collagen so if you're stressed and your serotonin's messed up or you're inflamed and your kynurinate goes up and your tryptophan is dropped it's a bummer that you can't make serotonin and melatonin. Totally agree with that. And yet the fact that you're inflamed probably doesn't feel good either. But what's even more important about that drop in tryptophan is that it blocks your ability to make proteins. Which proteins? All proteins, except for collagen, have to have tryptophan in them. So you think about your poor DNA. Your DNA is just sitting there trying to do its job. It's grabbing amino acids, according to the genetic code, and slamming them together into proteins. What kind of proteins? All proteins, like hemoglobin, kind of important for carrying oxygen. It could be a bone protein. It could be a protein for anything, any organ or any tissue, right? And if you don't have tryptophan, and it's trying to assemble a protein, and it goes to grab a tryptophan molecule, it's not there. Guess what? It can't make the protein. Which protein? All proteins. So. Not being able to make all proteins is a bigger problem than not being able to make serotonin. So whenever you see amino acids that are low, you want to think, okay, what are the non-protein functions of that amino acid, like with tryptophan making serotonin, but what are the protein functions? What does it do? It makes, it's important for making all proteins. It's not important, it's critical. So you just want to keep that in the back of your minds. And then today we're also going to talk about a whole other use of amino acids that's completely different, which is using free form amino acids in a huge dose all at one time to stimulate something called mTOR. Three different uses of amino acids. One, non-protein functions. Example, you take tryptophan because your tryptophan's low, you get more serotonin, now you're happy instead of sad. Okay. Protein function of tryptophan. What's tryptophan required for making? Proteins. Which proteins? All proteins except for collagen have to have tryptophan. You can't make a single protein in your body. You could not make a single enzyme in your body. Your metabolism would not work. If you're missing tryptophan, you can't make it, right? Your DNA is grabbing tryptophan to cram it into an enzyme or some kind of structure or hemoglobin molecule or whatever, and it can't do that assembly of that protein if tryptophan is missing. So tryptophan is important for protein or lysine. Lysine, you can say the exact same thing about it. I'm just using tryptophan because we're familiar with it. If you are missing lysine, you cannot assemble proteins. Which proteins? All proteins in the human body, okay? So then another use of amino acids that we're gonna talk about today is completely different. It's using large dosages of free form amino acids to stimulate mTOR. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail in a sec. But I just want to differentiate amino acids for individual uses, like you're low in serotonin, and then amino acids for protein synthesis. Why would you do that? For repair of any kind of tissue in the body. And then amino acids, like we're talking about today, specifically for mTOR stimulation. So why would you look at patients, uh, mitochondria, overweight, toxic, heart problems, fatigue, depression, all those kinds of things? The more ill that the patient becomes, the more the basics become super essential. And so I think you'll find almost every chronically ill patient has some series of major metabolic imbalances, and they may not respond very well until you start to address these. And so the amino acids and the B vitamins regulate all these metabolic processes, and so it's very important um, to have that in place and you know to know how to use the amino acids like we're going to talk about today and and to know how to use the B vitamins they really make up our metabolism right they're responsible for it so we talked about this a lot already protein synthesis role of amino acids what else do they do besides tryptophan making serotonin well if you're missing lysine this is not going to happen. If you're missing tryptophan, this is not going to happen. If you're missing glycine, if your glycine level is low, you're not going to make antibodies or enzymes. You're not going to make messenger proteins, structural proteins, or transport proteins. So what does that mean? Let's say you're missing lysine. It means you can't make antibodies. Is that important? Kind of. These days, everybody wants to have antibodies because there's a you know, deadly virus spreading throughout the planet. 
just being low in lysine is going to interfere with antibody production because you need all 20 amino acids to make all proteins. Every enzyme that we're talking about for metabolism, every enzyme that's involved in the citric acid cycle, every enzyme that converts glucose to acetyl-CoA into energy, they're proteins. Every single one of them is a protein, last time I checked, right? And they all have to have all 20 amino acids. It's not like there's some enzymes that convert sugar into energy that need 18 of these, right? They all require 20. They all require the same 20. Messenger proteins, that would be anything from, uh, you know, things that are, you know, circulating around some of the, some of the hormones, right? Um, not all of them, obviously. And then structural components as well as transport. And transport mechanism is really important, like, uh, like uh, sex hormone binding globulin, like, you know, stuff like that. So then, when we're thinking about, um, again, I'm picking on tryptophan now as a single example, but if this one amino acid is missing, you're going to have really big problems. So um, I just also think this is kind of funny, the International Journal of Tryptophan Research. Like, there's people who spend their whole lives researching tryptophan. I think that's kind of cool. Um, number one sentence from these guys, man, these are the tryptophan research people of the world. Protein synthesis, the principal role of tryptophan in the human body is as a constituent of protein synthesis. The principal role of tryptophan in the human body is as a constituent of protein synthesis. Not serotonin, protein, protein. Tryptophan is depleted by SSRI use. What's gonna happen then? It's gonna deplete protein synthesis throughout the whole body. So when we're using amino acids, which I'm gonna recommend you do today, it's going to have impacts not just on individual mechanisms, but body-wide. And here are the 20 amino acids that we're talking about. Okay, very, very important. So now, when we're going back to mitochondria for a second, I think, like, why are they even so important? Well, they're consuming oxygen, right? They're using the oxygen. And when we're trying to make cellular energy, most of our patients are not doing a great job at this, you know, you've got to have oxygen at the end of this whole thing to make it work. So when we think about mitochondria, and this is right out of the Dr. Richard Lord playbook. When you think mitochondrial problems, you think three things that you want to replace. CoQ10, magnesium, and oxygen. CoQ10 is a supplement, magnesium as a supplement, and then oxygen meaning breathing exercises. So very, very important to have oxygen as part of the treatment and have your patients who have mitochondrial problems do breathing exercises as the lifestyle change because that oxygen is critical. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about this stuff, uh, and this is kind of the classic diagram on um, mitochondria. So let's just jump right in here and look at this. Um, so on an organic acids test, you'll see fat and carb and protein and how well they're able to come into the citric acid cycle by being converted into acetyl-CoA to then ultimately be converted into ATP. So if you have a block right here, it means that it's hard to get fat into the citric acid cycle. If you have a block right here, which a lot of people do, it's hard to get glucose in, right? And you have a major blood sugar problem or metabolic syndrome or uh, insulin related problems, right? And if you have a block right here, it means you're going to be struggling to get amino acids into the citric acid cycle as well, okay? And it's obviously a huge, huge problem if you cannot burn glucose or carbohydrate. If pyruvate is high or lactate is high, it means there's a block here and that when that person consumes carbohydrate, they struggle to make acetyl-CoA. They're not making it effectively and they're not going to make enough ATP. So they're going to be tired, depressed, have heart problems, brain problems, detox problems with their liver, etc. Similarly, if the person's not able to burn fat for fuel because there's a block right here, Adipate, superate, ethylmalinate are going to go up. It's a carnitine deficiency problem. If you can't burn fat for energy, you're going to have fatigue, all the same exact problems that you would have, right, um, in relation to anything that's blocking mitochondrial energy production. So carnitine will unleash the ability to burn fat if adipate, superate, or ethylmalinate are high. If pyruvate or lactate are high, use B1 and B3 and CoQ10 to unleash that, and you'll get acetyl-CoA and energy production, and so on and so on. So what we're used to with organic acids markers, again, a high marker means there's a block, things are building up upstream, 
you give these nutrients and you get the enzymes to work properly and then the person gets better. And that's pretty straightforward uh, in terms of making a correction. And again, what are the key nutrients? CoQ10, magnesium, carnitine, B vitamins. You know, there's not that many choices. It's not like an infinite number. And that's gonna be in relation to high levels on the organic acids test. And the organic acids test, also known as a Nutraval, um, uh, also known as organics profile. There's a couple different variations of the test. They all look at the same exact markers, almost identical, okay? They're almost interchangeable. So um, low levels of patterns on organic acids. Now that's what we're really interested in. High levels means there's a block. Low level, if there's a low pattern, then there can be, if you know how to identify these patterns properly, a chronic lack of mitochondrial nutrients that has depleted mitochondrial populations. So now you've got a nutrient deficit. Let's say you start out with a deficit of magnesium or a deficit of CoQ10, whatever it may be. Let's say magnesium, a deficit of magnesium. Initially, these organic acids markers are gonna go high. Eventually your body's like, really? <laughs> like, what am I doing here? Am I gonna make a gazillion mitochondria every 10 seconds? when there's not even enough magnesium to go around? No, that would be a waste. So your body is very efficient and it just gives up. And it's like, all right, there's not enough magnesium here to make energy anyways. Let's just cut back on these mitochondrial populations. And this is exactly what my son measures, is they give things to mitochondria and they take things away from mitochondria and then they see how their populations grow and diminish based on taking these super high speed photos of them. It's like amazing, you can even do that. So this is not like a made up weird kind of thing that I just like thought about yesterday in the shower. This is like, there's like teams of scientists at the most elite universities in the world trying to figure this out. But what we're doing is just kind of piggybacking on that knowledge and saying, hey, it's kind of cool that you guys are doing this drug development trip and God bless you for doing that. But why don't we just take your research and apply it in a non-pharmaceutical way, okay? And how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna use amino acids. Okay, that's why we talked about amino acids in the beginning. So like the damage can also, cut. so the damage to the mitochondria populations could come about because of a lack of magnesium, right? The damage to mitochondrial populations could come about because of a lack of oxygen. There happens to be, you know, a worldwide pandemic going on. Maybe that's a little repetitive, but there happens to be an infection going on throughout the world right now whose main characteristic is that it decreases oxygen supply. You know, there's a lot of people that are gonna to start to suffer from this problem as if there weren't enough already. Separate from that, separate from that kind of horrible problem, you can also have a lot of oxidative stress or a lot of free radicals that can damage these tissues as well, okay? And, the, and ironically, this is like one of those weird little chicken and egg arguments, the major source of oxidative stress in the human body under normal conditions is the mitochondria. But what's supposed to happen is the mitochondria make energy, that energy production generates a boatload of oxidative stress, and then you have antioxidant protection that deals with that. So there's not a lot of damage. But if there's not enough antioxidants and your mitochondria are making energy, then you're gonna have all this oxidative stress that's out of control, ironically, that's coming from the mitochondria perhaps, and then that in and of itself is gonna damage the mitochondria. Then you can also obviously have damage to the mitochondria from environmental toxins, heavy metals, all the stuff that we've dumped into the environment. Obviously, you can also have problems you know, with the lack of you know, healthy food. There's a lot of different reasons why they can get damaged, but oxidative stress is kind of you know, top of the list, okay? And so when we're now thinking about depression, chronic fatigue, post-COVID syndrome, all these things where there's been a lack of oxygen or a lack of magnesium or a lack of oxidative uh, protection, you know, lack of uh, antioxidants, and that's led to damage to mitochondria, which would show you high markers or on organic acids, right? Or even worse, reduction in mitochondrial populations, which Dr. Lord terms mitochondrial retraction, then we want to start to think about reversing that. And how do we do that? Free form amino acids to stimulate mTOR. Caveat, you don't want to do this with a cancer patient 
obviously, because you don't want to stimulate cell growth with cancer patients, but if they don't have cancer or a history of cancer and they have low mitochondrial populations, this is a very good idea. It's a whole different way to use amino acids. It's a different mechanism of action. And that's why in the beginning of the talk, I mentioned about non-protein uses of amino acids. Like you give, um, I don't know, what do you guys do all the time? You don't even think about, it. oh, you give glutamine for healing the leaky gut. Everybody does that all the time, right? That's a non-protein use of an amino acid because the gut needs a lot of glutamine. You could also use a tyrosine to bring back catecholamine levels or to help with the thyroid. But you can then again use individual or groups of amino acids to stimulate protein synthesis, synthesis of all proteins. And this is a special case example where you can use a large single dose of free-form amino, free amino acids to stimulate mTOR. Low organic acids markers can be reversed by stimulating mTOR. That's kind of the secret knowledge that I want you to take home and start to think about. The same supplement can be used, oh, and this is where it gets a little tricky. If you're looking at a NutraVal or an ion panel, the, the patient with the low markers for mitochondria may or may not have low amino acids on their test. We're not using amino acids in this case to replace amino acids. We're using amino acids to stimulate a specific pathway. Okay, so you can use an amino acid formula just because they're low in amino acids, and that's just replacing a missing nutrient. That's pretty easy. You don't need to like listen to an hour of me ranting and raving to figure that out, right? You look at the lab, the amino acids are low, you just give a bunch of amino acids, done. What we're talking about is using amino acids specifically to stimulate mTOR. Pretty cool stuff. So again, mitochondrial attraction, sustained reduction in the number of mitochondrial functional units per cell. This decrease has been created by the body on purpose, not an accident. It's been done to compensate for chronically reduced levels of enzymes and cofactors necessary to complete the transfer of electrons to oxygen. So your citric acid cycle is screwed up. You're not making ATP. Your mitochondrial numbers start to drop. So extreme patterns of low levels of mitochondrial organic acids markers, again, mean they're not enough. High levels of organic acid markers is something completely different, right? That's a nutrient depletion problem. So what is mTOR? Mammalian target of rapamycin. Sometimes it's called the mechanistic target of rapamycin. Most of you probably heard about this, right? Um, but anyways, it's a little weird. There are these scientists on Easter Island, and they found it on Rapa Nui. Like, what the heck? Is some weird spiritual convergence kind of thing happened? Except for they discovered like one of the most important mechanisms in the human body as a result of this whole thing. It's a great story if you want to read about rapamycin. It's pretty interesting. It's one of those science stories where you're like, wow. It sounds like an Indiana Jones movie, but it's actually really real. So. Um, the roles of mTOR, I don't think you can really see that very well, but mTOR basically, there we go, let me blow that up. mTOR basically allows muscle tissue to do its thing. It allows liver tissue to do its thing. It stimulates the pancreas in really good ways, right? So it has this role across all these different body mechanisms simultaneously. It's a very profound thing. And the purposes of what we're talking about now, we want to use it specifically to, um, to stimulate mitochondrial growth patterns so people aren't so tired anymore, you know? So uh, how the hypometabolic states get started, as I mentioned, hypoxia. I'm just giving single examples so you can start to get your mind clicking here. Tryptophan depletion because of taking SSRIs, would that cause the problem? Yeah, of course it would because not enough tryptophan, not able to make proteins, right? Ding, ding, ding kind of consequence. You could have low glutathione or low magnesium or low CoQ10. Any of those would trigger this problem. Toxin exposure. GI issues, right? There could be a lot of different things. And we want to then use on the treatment side free form amino acids, including tryptophan. And you want to use at least at least two teaspoons at a time, two teaspoons of free form amino acids from one of our favorite companies, okay? On an empty stomach, you need to then with meals typically give CoQ10, magnesium, PQQ, a pretty decent dose of B vitamins 
maybe some other mitochondrial support like carnitine if you want, okay? And that will start to get these um, mitochondrial populations to, to come back and start to grow. Now, how does this relate to thyroid? Well, if your mitochondrial populations are low and you have a thyroid problem, even if you're on the right amount of thyroid medication, there's not enough mitochondria for the thyroid to direct. So what common pattern we've seen, and this happened in class, in the, in the, um, in the mentorship class, I don't know, maybe a couple years ago, maybe a year and a half or two years ago, but I was talking about hypometabolic patterns and a couple of the doctors in the class were like, yeah, Dan, you know, we just started to work with this ourselves and um, this is where the student becomes a teacher, right? So I'm learning from the students in the class and uh, two of the doctors on the same call said, yeah, you know, I've got a bunch of thyroid patients who I had been working with and prescribing thyroid hormones to and they really, made a little difference but not a lot as soon as we put them on this hypometabolic program thyroid medications kicked in fully and now we've got the kind of results that we were looking for so it makes total sense right because the thyroid is directing the mitochondria if there's not enough of them present doesn't matter how dialed in you get the thyroid hormones or what kind of t3 or t4 or herb or thing you are using or glandular whatever you're trying to do to get Westroid or Synthroid or Armor or whatever it is you're using, if the mitochondria aren't present in sufficient numbers, it's going to have a middling effect, you know, like a not so satisfying effect. And so you can also have people that have mild thyroid problems, and if you just get the mitochondria working properly, the thyroid problem will improve, right? But you, some people will also require thyroid medications and the mitochondrial correction. It can go in different ways. So um, in terms of correcting the high mitochondrial marker patterns, and we're going to take a break in a minute, then come back and look at some labs, okay? Um, you also use CoQ10, magnesium, and B vitamins and carnitine, but you don't need to go through the whole ordeal of stimulating mTOR. These people should be much easier to correct. They should respond a lot faster. Okay? So again, mitochondrial damage from a variety of sources, once they're damaged and they're not able to make sufficient ATP, there's going to be a moment in time, typically initially, where these markers go super high. And for decades, everyone thought that was it. You know, if these markers are high, there's a problem. In fact, Dr. Lord said this just a couple weeks ago, that 20 years ago, when he would see low mitochondrial markers, he would tell the practitioner on the, on the phone that he was talking to, oh, that's great, doc. These markers are really low. They're all really low. That means the enzymes are super efficient. They're doing their work. They're clearing everything. You know, it's going great. And then the doctor is like, well, why does my patient have chronic fatigue then? And nobody knew at that time about these hypometabolic states. And the research hadn't come out yet about free form amino acids stimulating mTOR. Okay. So what are these results? What are the results of these metabolic disturbances? The fatigue, the weight gain, the depression, all these kinds of things. Free form amino acid formulas been used for decades, and I know 30 years ago when I was first starting to study this kind of work and starting my career, there was a, um, a psychiatrist, Dennis, a in my office, my, my very first office, and I don't, I would, he was kind of this old guy that worked in the back, and honestly, I didn't pay a lot of attention to him, but he, all he did was amino acid testing on psych patients, and people would walk in, see him for an hour, and walk out with their amino acids, and that went on for years, and, you know, it's funny to look back on that and realize, wow, that guy was like way ahead of his time. But anyways, what we're looking for is the stimulation of mTOR. And then, of course, you don't want to do this um, with uh, cancer patients. Okay, we're going to take a commercial break. I'm going to come back in a minute and we're going to look at labs. But in the meantime, we're going to say again, as a reminder for those of you that came in late, we're starting a new mentorship class January 25th. If you use this code, you get $1,000 off. Okay, we're starting a boot camp on telehealth business essentials February 8th. If you're interested in that, you can register and check out both of these at kalisinstitute.com. You can do some Zoom tours with Jennifer if you want to see what we're really up to. And we're signing up people right now for the new mentorship. So if you guys are psyched about doing it and you want to review labs and do classes like we're doing tonight every day for a year, then you can join. And let's see. Let me pull, and then we're going to, I'm going to look at one or two labs, and then we can take some questions. All right, pause here for a moment. Get my labs lined up. Whew. 
Let's see, here we go. Now, I don't know. I'm just, I do this randomly. I don't know why, because it's just, I don't know. I just do it randomly. So I'm just going to pick one. Let's see. I hope it's a good one. Should we do an ion? Let's do an ion. Okay, now. Here we go. You ready? Round two, lab review. Okay, so now let's start. And I will, I, I promise we will do. Oh, I don't want that. Hang on a second. Um, we're going to answer questions at the end, okay? But let's look at a couple labs first because there's a ton of questions that came in, like 100 million questions. All right, so right off the bat, we're looking at an uh, amino acid test. What do you see there? Do you see that low lysine? Can everybody see that? Raise your hand if you can see that. So what if that lysine level is low, what's that going to interfere with? There's specific functions of lysine we're not really worried about, non-protein functions. Lysine is a precursor to carnitine. So lysine is how you make carnitine. Carnitine is how you burn fat or, burn or bring fat into the mitochondria. So if you don't have enough lysine, you're not going to have a great amount of carnitine to metabolize or burn up fat. That's a pretty big problem. But even worse than that, lysine is one of the amino acids, one of the 20 that you need to make proteins. Which proteins? All proteins in the human body except for collagen. Hemoglobin, right? Blood proteins, bone proteins, heart proteins, every enzyme that does everything. So if lysine is low, it's going to have a problem that sort of ricochets around the body in really negative ways. Right? So that's our – and remember, you can give amino acids – to stimulate mTOR to make the mitochondria grow, even if the even if the amino acid levels are normal. So let's take a look. Here's another portion of the organics of the ion panel organic acids test, and we simply count up out of the first 21 markers how many are low. Okay, it's not that hard. So fatty acids let's just count one, two. Uh, Three, low means first quintile or not detected. Four, five, six, seven, eight. I got lucky. Eight. Eight out of the first 21 markers here are low. If more than six are low, it's considered a hypometabolic state. There's some caveats to that. There's some other details that I'm kind of skipping over here. But anyways, that's a basic rule of thumb. If you see a pattern where six or more are low, you start to suspect hypometabolic, okay? And then what do you do? A couple of teaspoons, two teaspoons of free-form amino acids all at one time on an empty stomach. It has to have tryptophan in it, okay, because tryptophan is one of the essentials. And then you add in magnesium, CoQ10, B vitamins. You can do some carnitine, some PQQ to get those mitochondria to start to grow. But anyways, I got lucky on that one. Let me pick one more here. I am panels for webinar. That's kind of a vaguely titled. Uh... File, let's see. Well, wow, look at that. Well, that's kind of cool and random. See all these high amino acids. Who knows what that means? That's a good question. Hmm. Not answering that. That's not about today's class. Let's see. Okay. Now, oh, this is a good one. So here we have another. Uh, organic acids profile, and we're looking at mitochondrial markers. And look, ethylmalinate is high. Remember, when there's a high marker, that means there's a block. In this case, there's a block in being able to get fat into the Krebs cycle. L-lactate is high. That means there's a block in being able to get glucose into the Krebs cycle. Succinate is high. That means there's a block in the Krebs cycle itself. So again, and then hydroxymethylglutarate is high. That means there's a block in the citric acid cycle. So let me show you uh, exactly what that means. Uh, would help if I hit the right button here. Oh, there we go. Don't forget to sign up for the mentorship. 
There we go, here. Okay, so that first one that you saw, ethyl malinate, was high. That means there's a block here getting fat to make energy. Carnitine will fix that, unblock that. L-lactate was high. That means there's a block right here getting carbohydrate to acetyl-CoA. Arguably, that's one of the most important processes in the body, being able to get carbohydrate to acetyl-CoA. That's as important as it gets. If you can't do that, you need to give the person B1 and B3, and a lot of people have a genetic defect that causes lactate to go up unless they get some extra B1 and B3 and maybe some CoQ10 to push this through. Then they'll get that acetyl-CoA, then they'll make the ATP, then they'll get over that whole insulin regulation, blah blah problem, right? And then we saw also in this same patient, succinate I think was high. So there's a block right here in the citric acid cycle itself. So imagine for this person, if you have a block right here, a block right here, and another block down here, how are you gonna feel? Not that great. How are you gonna you know, look? Not that great. You're not gonna be burning fat that great. You're gonna eat carbs and it's gonna make you all wonky and weird, right? So there's gonna just be a whole different set of problems that you know, occur if someone has that. And again, it's just right here on the test. It's not too complicated. Like I would say honestly, for the whole couple hundred dollars of this test, just to get lactate as a marker, it's worth a couple hundred bucks, just to know that one thing about a patient. It's so profound that you can see that. Um, hydroxymethylglutarate is specifically a CoQ10 marker. And for all these markers, you need um, uh, magnesium, right? Okay. Let's see if there's one more here. And then I'll go to questions and we'll wrap it up. Uh, oh, this looks, yeah, let's find another test. Here. All right. So again, oh, ouch. Ooh, that doesn't look very good, does it? Okay, so this is fat burning. Fatty acid metabolism. Adipate, superate, ethylmalinate, they're all three high. Okay, that's like three strikes. Not good. That means you're going to have fat accumulating in places that are unsightly that you don't want it and it means you're going to be tired because you can't burn fat for energy bad problem simple solution carnitine and vitamin b2 carnitine and vitamin b2 and if it's not working you're probably underdosing the person okay if it's not working if it's not working don't think it's broken or something just you know safely incrementally increase the dosages till you get some action going and then look at all these markers here that are high. So remember, high means there's a block and there's a nutrient deficit. A low pattern, where they're you know, predominantly low, means that there's not even enough mitochondria to respond. So this person needs CoQ10 and magnesium and oxygen because the citric acid, citric acid cycle relies upon magnesium, CoQ10, and oxygen to get this all going. And then they need a boatload of carnitine to get their fat burning going. And then all of a sudden they're going to come in and say, wow, doc, I don't know what's in that stuff, but I can bike my bike up the hill twice as fast as I used to be able to. And then uh, the B vitamins, also very, very important for metabolism. Okay, so let me pause there for a moment. And let me look at questions and see. I can answer a few questions before... We all go our separate ways. This stuff really works, by the way. You know, and like, it's not my magnetic personality or anything about me that makes this stuff work. In fact, you know, we I see students of mine in the classes getting better results than I do, which is satisfying to me, you know? It's not like that's a bad thing. It actually makes me happy. We've had in the last, I don't know if there are any students on the call right now. There are probably a few people that are in class on the call. But in the last two months, we've had two cases that were brand new students. The first six months of the course, each of them was working with an autistic child. Each of them did a basic protocol right out of the class, and each of them had a 
the same story. Um, one was a girl, one was a boy. Had the uh, autistic child uh, starting to speak for the first time in its life. Pretty incredible stuff. This stuff really works, you know. And, and you understand the physiology and mechanisms behind it, then it makes a lot more sense. Okay, I'm looking at questions now for a sec. Uh, let's see. I think I answered that one about ion panels. Let's see. Um, oh, do we offer an independent class for functional nutrigenomics? Yeah, look at the website. Later this year, we're going to have some more courses coming out. So, JE, keep, uh, keep an eye on the website, or we'll send you some emails too. We'll have some new classes coming out later this year uh, for the graduates of the, of the mentorship specifically. Um, Lynn had a question, would one low amino acid and the inability to make proteins drive all the amino acid markers down on the oat? It could go either way, right? Because if you're, let's say you're missing an amino acid and you're not making detoxification enzymes very well, like you're not making cytochrome P450 enzymes very well, then what's going to happen? Mm, the detox markers are going to go up, right? So that one could go either way. Um, I don't, this has nothing to do with anything other than I think this is really cool. Let me see if I can find this. Uh, oh, I don't want to waste your time, but well, I, I have a picture of cytochrome P450. It's a beautiful enzyme if you're into it, looking at enzymes. Uh, oh, well, I can't find it here. Oh, wait, is this it? No. Oh, well, if you want, ever want to look these things up, they look really cool. There, it's amazing. Oh, here it is. Is that it? Oh, no, I can't find it. Oh, well, I don't have that lecture organized yet. But it's a beautiful looking enzyme. Let me just show you just for a second. Right here, look at what these look like. So cool. Like that, there's an enzyme right there in the mitochondrial membrane. Beautiful structure, isn't it? There's another enzyme. So cool. They're complicated. They're strings of amino acids linked together, right? And then they fold into all these really bizarre shapes. Here's here's a really cool one. Look at that. That's a pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme. That's some complicated stuff. And you know these little pink doohickey things? That's the B vitamin. That's the B vitamin locking that thing down. So you got this big complex B vitamin, big complex enzyme, and then the B vitamin kind of slots in there and locks the whole thing in place. I don't know, if like if you're a bike rider, if they ever have a quick release on your wheel, you know, and it's a nice big, you know, $1,000 bicycle wheel, but if that quick release is loose, it's going to fly and you're going to die. The, the B vitamins are like a quick release. They kind of lock the enzyme in place so it can operate properly. Uh, here's an insulin molecule. Here's another enzyme. I don't know. They're just incredible structures. So these are strings of amino acids, right? One amino acid missing, you can't make it. Uh, so if someone has cancer, I wouldn't do, I would not do the mTOR stimulation thing, but there's plenty of other things you could do, you know, um, plenty of others. Let's see. If you're not seeing the slides, then you just need to close the camera feature and then open up the other slide part, okay? Um, Yeah, and Claire is saying, well, given the fact that most of us are likely deficient in some of these amino acids and, and none of us are folding proteins correctly, how come we are, aren't more sick? Well, you know, I don't know. I think it's very rare that you see a vital, active, sexually active, emotionally active, mentally active, physically active human being, you know? And to answer Claire's question, like, you know, just – you know, we're all kind of like one amino acid down, aren't we? You know, it's kind of sad. Uh, yes, you get a replay, Rita. Yeah, well, we'll send out a link to the replay so you can listen to this a few times. Uh, let's see. Yeah, oh, good question, Emily. Would you still give free form amino acids to, to stimulate mitochondrial production if an individual had one or more amino acids that were high? 
absolutely yes. Absolutely yes, because high amino acids, assuming we're talking about a blood test, high amino acids on a blood test, high amino acids on a blood test mean they're circulating in the bloodstream, not getting into the cells. And so typically, if you see high amino acids on a blood test, well, it could be that they're over supplementing, but assuming they're not over supplementing, you want to give some B vitamins so they can break it down better. PQQ for Paula is a um, mitochondrial biogenesis supplement you can buy from all the different companies. What form of magnesium? I use a chelated magnesium or magnesium glycinate, something that's kind of easy on the stomach. Um, have you seen uh, mitochondrial disruption in uh, long haul post COVID patients? Absolutely, yes. Yes, yes, and yes. In fact, we had one in class uh, the day before yesterday. Whew. And I've got another one where we had her tests, she got COVID, and then we had another round of tests with organic acids and amino acids and all of these things. And, um, you know, I don't want to, you know, be negative here, but man, we are going to all be facing tens of thousands of patients in the coming years that are going to be exhausted after COVID. And I think some of them, not all, but some of them, you're going to see these kinds of mitochondrial problems, okay? So you really want to learn these protocols so you can help those people. It's not that hard. Um, and so I don't do any of these programs for women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. I just wait until that's all done and come back and do it later. Um, let's see, why do you prefer? Let's see. So um, I, I use the one from Genova Lab because Richard Lord is the one that set that machine up and he's been training me for the last four years. There's other good lab companies out there. Um, I just don't know their format as well, okay? Um, so you can also, the ones that I'm most familiar with would be Nutraval or Organics Profiles or Ion Panels from Genova. And there's also at least two or three other companies that run these, okay? Yep, you're gonna get, uh, let's see. So with amino acids, um, when you're doing this, another kind of cool way you can do this is let's say you do the free form amino acids, two teaspoons, and it has all the aminos in it, including tryptophan. Then look at the rest of their test. If they're also showing a sign of a tyrosine deficit, put in some extra tyrosine. You just have them, have them dump in a couple extra capsules of tyrosine into it. Or if they're um, having a, a pneumonia clearance problem, have them put in a little extra arginine. So you can get a, what would equate to a custom amino acid formula, starting with the base of the powder and then dumping in extras from capsules to make the, the thing work a little bit better. So in terms of long-term use of these, so every six months I stop and have people retest, okay? I wouldn't do these programs for longer than six months without stopping and retesting. It's not something you necessarily want to do um, if you don't need to, unless you're like a bodybuilder or a weightlifter, or you want to be absolutely ripped and have a body that looks like you're in some action movie and you're a superhero kind of body. So clearly weightlifters use amino acids um, to get ripped and, you know, big and muscly and all that kind of stuff. Um, but in my world, I mean, my patients are not trying to compete in like Ms. America body world championship kind of thing. They just want to get out of the house and have energy again, right? So every six months we stop, retest. When the pro when the when the products have worked, then we stop. Obviously when everything's normalized then we stop. Um, if you took these amino acids long term and you're exercising a lot, you're gonna get really muscular and fit and lean and ripped. I don't know if that's bad or not. You know, if you want to look like that, go for it, you know. Um, I mean we're talking about like nine grams of amino acids. It's not something that's gonna like kill you or something. Uh, let's see. If you have a mix of high and low, then it's complicated, right? Then um, it can be a lot of different things. That depends on the other things that are going on. Uh, and so oh, for Dr. Michael, um, I'm using uh, Genova for the organic acids test. Uh, oh, and Rita said, yes, my son is autistic and this is a game changer, yeah. I mean, we had two doctors in the last two months who both had the same story, different groups of classes in the mentorship. One was Lars, a medical doc in Germany, 
And I was crying on the phone. I think half the other students were crying too because Lars was like, damn, I can't believe this. All I did was take this little girl and put her on a mitochondrial support program. And the parents came back in a couple of weeks and said she started talking for the first time. And we're like, oh my God, that's so cool. And you know, like, like it wasn't just that Lars did that. It's like he said that in class to all the other students. So then everyone's realizing, wow, now there's something, there's some depth here. Are we trying to cure or treat autism? Absolutely not. That would be crazy town. You can't say that. That's crazy. But, you know, any human being has the potential to heal. And we certainly don't want to give up, no matter how much chronic fatigue or depression the person has. You want to try these things and see if you can help. Okay. Um, and then uh, a couple of questions here about dosages. So, I, you know, you want to work with, if you're not in my class, you know, be careful and just don't make anybody sick. But, you know, for B-complex, you can give maybe two or three B-complex a day, one with each meal. For magnesium, you can get up to 400, 600 milligrams a day. Um, be careful if they get diarrhea, you want to back off. For CoQ10, you can go anywhere from 200 a day to 1,000 a day. It's just very expensive. Most people can't afford that much CoQ10. So you want to taper people up until you're starting to get a therapeutic response, okay? Um, and I would never do any of this unless you had a lab test. I, I think that's kind of risky. I would only do this based on labs. And yeah, there's a benefit to the powdered free-form aminos. It's just uh, for Paula, um, it's just not as many pills to swallow. But it's a, at the end of the day, it's the same thing. So. Um, Uh, and again, you've got to do this based on labs. I wouldn't do this just randomly. And then in order to know uh, for Neelam uh, what amino acids are high or low, you just have to do the test. You can't really tell from symptoms necessarily. Uh, if someone's on an SSRI, you have to be kind of extra careful for Stephanie out there. Um, you can still do the free-form amino acids, but I'd probably keep it to one to two teaspoons once or twice a day, assuming that the lab show they need it. Um, and I think we're running out of time here. Um, I, yeah, let's see here. Uh, with, uh, with The concern with cancer is that if you stimulate mTOR, it stimulates cell growth. And with cancer, that's kind of the problem that you're having, right? So you don't want to, you don't want to do that. And then there's there's uh, two companies that I use. I use Pure Encapsulations free-form amino acids, and I use the Designs for Health formula of free-form amino acids. All right, and then uh, Jennifer's question. I usually have people stop the supplements for at least three days and then retest, and we see what's going on. Uh, you know, So do a lab, do a six-month program, stop for three days, and then retest. Oh, now, Suresh, thank you for asking that question. So, Suresh, Suresh, you still there? I hope you are. We're a little bit over time. But Suresh's question is, why is it that giving two teaspoons of free-form amino acids at once make that, makes that much of a difference that it triggers mTOR, but giving the standard dose one teaspoon does not? That is the big question. That is, man, Suresh, you know, that's a good question. So... If you give one teaspoon of amino acids twice a day, that is not enough to stimulate mTOR. And if you go to Dr. Lord's book, you can click on the original research that talks about this. Okay, I've looked at it too, it's pretty cool. What these guys figured out is that when you get up to this threshold of like eight or nine or 10 grams of crystalline free form amino acids all at one time on an empty stomach, when that hits your bloodstream, your body is just like, wow, <laughs> that's not supposed to happen. It's probably like the equivalent of eating like an entire chicken or an entire cow at one time, right? It's more amino acids than ever hit your bloodstream all at one time under any kind of normal conditions. Even if you're like the paleo queen of the world and all you do is eat raw meat, okay? There's no way that food could do this. So this massive amount, this single bolus of amino acids hitting your bloodstream and for some reason, your body goes, ah, there's all these amino acids. We don't know what to do. We're cramming them into every corner we can. We can't burn them up for fuel right now quickly enough. What the heck are we going to do? Whew, stimulate mTOR. Let's get some cell growth going. Okay, so it's it's dose dependent. 
And these researchers actually looked at this. They tried different amounts and they found somewhere around seven, eight, nine, ten 10 grams. mTOR just goes crazy town, okay? It makes sense when you think about it. It's not a normal experience that your body would ever have. It's really, you're losing like the free form amino acids like you would use a drug. You're using them to stimulate a physiological process. And again, remember, this is not about people who are low in amino acids. This is about people who are low in mitochondria. The labs for amino acids could look perfectly normal. They could look high, they could look low. That doesn't matter. We're using the amino acids specifically to stimulate mTOR. And if, again, the amino acids on a blood test are high, it means the person needs more vitamin B6, means they're circulating in the blood, they're not getting into the cells. So you wanna to try to correct that separately. It's a fascinating mechanism, right? And you guys should read about mTOR. And, and read, if you wanna look at Richard Lord's book, you know, he'll go through all the research on that specifically. Um, let me show you here uh, the book. This is available as a book from iTunes or the iBooks store, wherever you buy your i stuff, you know. Um, you cannot download it on a PC. You have to get it uh, and put it on a Mac or an iPad. I use an iPad for mine. And it's called Laboratory Guides to Health, Richard S. Lord. And again, iBooks, iTunes, download it on your Macintosh. If you're hip enough to have a Macintosh, if you're old like I am, you have a PC, you can download it on an iPad. And it's clickable, right? It's You can move around in it, it's pretty cool. It's an interactive book, um, which is why he put it on that platform. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna wrap it up for tonight. Thank you guys for all the great questions. Hope you learned something. If you're interested, check out our mentorship. We're starting in a couple of weeks, January 25th. You get a thousand bucks off. It's a great class. It's a great group of doctors to get involved with. You learn a lot. And if you're interested in growing your business, check out our telehealth business essentials. And um, I hope to see you in one of the classes soon. Okay, bye for now.